Thanks, uh, Dr. Hazy, and uh, thanks uh, to the moderators, one of whom is having his 52nd birthday today. I think you can figure out which one that is. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with a few PowerPoint slides just to make sure that you understand what we're doing during the, um, during the uh, uh, actual video. So that's not working. So uh, that's my backyard. That's a tornado last summer. Uh, so this is the yellow brick road. You remember from um, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, actually, this patient had a lot of big stones. Those don't come out through a cystic duct usually. So you wind up needing to uh, have uh, uh, other techniques. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is a transcystic exploration and a few other things as well. Actually, I guess we've gone to the video instead of, uh, anyhow, one of the, th can you uh, just stop that for a second? One of the things that we, uh, uh, that the reason a lot of people don't do uh, cholangiograms and common duct explorations is because we're not prepared for it. So having all the equipment available and localized in one place de decreases the amount of angst that everyone has. So if we know we're gonna be doing a common duct exploration, we have a separate Mayo stand you can start the video again. Uh, all set up with a cholidocoscope on it uh, and, uh, and with the C-arm in the room. In fact, we have the C-arm in the room for every lap coli. And once the people are used to coming up and doing it, it's not a big hassle to get it done. So that's the general setup in the operating room. The nurse actually uh, sets up the uh, common duct cart uh, off the, uh, to the right there. That gets covered with uh, a sterile drape while we're uh, uh, doing the rest of the surgery. And then I like to keep that on the right side of the surgeon uh, so that when we have to use it, uh, we just pull it into the table. We don't have to change sides. We don't open all of this equipment uh, unless we're sure that we're gonna need it. Usually we'll start with either a basket or a Fogarty catheter, uh, uh, usually a four French vascular catheter, not the biliary catheter. The stents in the background are those to dilate the cystic duct if you need to. Usually to get the scopes in nowadays, you need at least to get to a nine French size, and they fit it right over a guide wire uh, that the urologists have. So that's the cholidocoscopic uh, Mayo stand. Uh, and when, again, when we start, we just pull it right in. We don't have to change sides. And the scope usually goes in through the midclavicular port, not the... Uh, uh, not the uh, other ports. Uh, so this is obviously uh, a cholangiogram with two large stones. As it turns out, this patient uh, had a really wide cystic duct and we we're able to get those out through the cystic duct. But we start with a cholangiogram, use the 14 gauge intracap, uh, about three centimeters medial to the midclavicular port. Uh, and that's a nice access for both the cholangiogram catheter as well as four French Fogarty catheters. And we insert it into the cystic duct uh, and put a clip partially across it. We then test it for uh, water tightness uh, and then uh, perform the cholangiogram. And so if you've got all this set up, the uh, radiology tech just has to wheel the machine in. Uh, and you may or may not be able to see that I have uh, a lead apron on uh, to, help, uh, to help protect. And then that peels off uh, after the cholangiogram is finished. So with the fluoroscope, uh, we're able to scan the entire duct. In the old days uh, that Dr. Ponsky and I lived through, uh, we did uh, uh, static films that took 20 or 30 minutes to get back from radiology. This lets you do everything in about a minute or so. And then uh, the surgeon can peel off the, the uh, lead and proceed with the rest of the operation. Now coming up, there'll be a, a, about a 10 second uh, black part of the video that didn't come across. But this is, these are the uh, things that we can do uh, to clear the duct, flushing uh, for small stones with glucagon, balloon or basket extraction, and then a transcystic uh, extraction, possibly a cholidocotomy that somebody else will, will talk about. The glucagon, when uh, the, you have the anesthetist give the glucagon, you have to be ready to, in, uh, to inject the dye because it has almost an immediate effect. So 
I like to have them tell me exactly when they're starting to uh, flush it in. And you can see that there was a tiny stone that passed through. So the, the way that I, back in 1990, the way that I first did a common duct exploration laparoscopically was to use uh, a four French Fogarty catheter uh, and uh, uh, drag it back through the duct. And this is actually from a video back from 1990. And you'll see a couple of uh, uh, cholesterol stones uh, come emitted through the cystic duct. <clears throat> when, uh, when that doesn't work, uh, we will use a basket. The basket will go through that same 14 gauge sleeve and we insert that into the cystic duct just like we would for uh, uh, a cholangiogram and then we uh, go after these stones. These are the stones from that initial uh, cholangiogram. And you can see how wide that cystic duct is uh, and it allowed us to get those stones out. And then if necessary, uh, we can uh, pull out the uh, cholidocoscope that goes in through the uh, cystic duct uh, and in, into the common. Uh, we like to use a four-wire uh, four uh, Segura-type basket with straight wires, not the helical ones. And then keep the stone in view with a little bit of the uh, basket uh, available so you can see it come out. Can you stop the video for a second? One of the things that uh, is important to note, I don't know if, if this, uh, where's the laser here? Um, Actually, we'll do this. Uh, the direction of the port that the uh, scope is going into needs to be pointed toward the, uh, toward the common duct. Uh, many times in your excitement of trying to get this duct clear, this gets pushed way out to the side here, and it makes the scope have to take two angles. It can make it very difficult. The other important thing uh, is that the gallbladder has to be pushed up toward the uh, right diaphragm uh, almost just the opposite of what you just saw in the open case. It actually pulls the common duct up anteriorly and straightens it out for you. You can restart the video. So the, the more direct route that you have into the uh, cystic duct or common duct if you're doing a uh, cholidocotomy uh, is by making that port directed toward it. When you're taking things out through the cystic, uh, sometimes you have to uh, exert a little force and it's better to uh, grasp the actual basket rather than the, uh, rather than the scope itself. So uh, these are the things that you've already heard make it uh, difficult to do a, a common duct exploration, especially through the cystic duct. So in those cases, we would do a cholidocotomy, uh, see the stone uh, and obviously um, uh, grasp it and, and back it out. Then we take it out through one of the ports. Uh, as the previous speaker mentioned, we always get a completion cholangiogram to make sure that we haven't left any problems behind. Th then you can close the duct uh, either primarily uh, if the conditions are correct or you can place a T-tube. And I usually will use, in most cases, we'll use a 4-0 uh, vicryl uh, suture and then leave a drain in whether I put a T-tube in or not. Again, we cut the back side of the uh, T out so it's easier to uh, take it out. To, and we usually wait at least four weeks as well. So um, that's the pretty much the end of the, the video. If we could go back to the slides, I can make just a couple more points. Uh, about that. Uh, 23 years ago, the European Association of Endoscopic Surgeons uh, uh, produced a consensus paper that said we need to be able to do this in one setting rather than have a uh, subsequent ERCP. Uh, however, uh, what we're seeing in the United States, uh, this is from a paper that uh, Tom Helling did in 2008, uh, and then Tom Magnuson gave me this uh, slide. In 2011, uh, graduating surgical residents usually had less than one common duct exploration open or laparoscopic under their belts. So obviously we need to change that. Uh, when we don't cure the patient at the time of surgery and we, and we need to take all those uh, extra steps to the right of that graph, you can see that it almost doubles the cost. And that hasn't affected us yet, uh, but it will uh, when there is just one price for for curing the, the, uh, the gallbladder problem. 
So we prefer to be on the right side of, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, algorithm, not, not on the left. This is from a uh, thing we produced for uh, John Cameron's uh, book. <clears throat> and then the, the, the cholangiogram. In order to uh, decide uh, whether we do transcystic or transductal, uh, it's a function of the stones, uh, the ductal anatomy, and the surgical skill. If, and the negative things here are what really affect uh, which uh, direction you'll be leaning. Stones that are larger than six millimeters usually won't come out through the cystic duct. Intrahepatic stones uh, are difficult to get out that way unless it's a very short cystic duct. Uh, if the cystic duct's less than four millimeters in diameter, uh, you're not gonna be able to di dilate it up to a nine French. And if the common duct is uh, narrower than six millimeters, uh, you have to be very good at suturing so you don't create a stricture if you're gonna use that technique. If the cystic duct is long and circuitous, uh, or if it enters quite distally, getting proximal stones out is gonna be quite difficult. Or if the inflammation is marked, then a choledocotomy may be somewhat dangerous. And then if your suturing skill is not up to par, uh, you're gonna most likely not to try to perform a choledocotomy. Uh, we've gone through what we needed. Those are the four French uh, Fogarty-type vascular catheters, not the biliary catheter. And then the Segura straight wire basket, uh, it'll uh, fit over, uh, uh, it'll fit through that medial port as well. Uh, and that all can be a head-banging experience if you don't organize it uh, on a common bile duct cart. That, it, that relieves a lot of angst for the nurses uh, and the surgeons. Uh, and again, this is what you've seen on the video. Most of the time, we don't open all that stuff. We'll open the basket, uh, and usually we'll, uh, what I'll do is have Sherry open the basket before the scope is ever pulled, so uh, we don't uh, have to uh, uh, send it down for 24 hours again. And then that's sitting there, you've, you've seen this. Um, the glucagon, again, as soon as uh, the anesthetist is in, uh, infusing it, you need to, uh, uh, to be ready to shoot the cholangiogram and then uh, flush it and sometimes you'll get small stones out. But stones larger than three millimeters I don't think are gonna flush through the, through the ampulla. So that's again how we do that. Again, those are uh, things from the video. We can use the Fogarty as you saw there. It can also be put alongside the cholidocoscope uh, if you have enough room in a cholidocotomy and then you drag it back and you can see the stone uh, there, there are some larger stones here, uh, but again, the Fogarty helps pull them back up to a place where you can get to them. Uh, that's the dilatation uh, things. When you're gonna dilate the cystic duct, we use these over the wire uh, dilators. It goes in through the midclavicular port, as you can see here, into the cystic duct in common. And if you can't get to a nine French, you're probably not gonna be able to get the scope in. These cost a lot of money, so I don't tend to use them, the pneumatic balloons. Uh, and then the scope, it's important when you're working with the scope that you don't bend it, or if you're passing it off to an assistant, that they don't bend it too acutely at that the midclavicular port. This is the other, there's two important slides in, in all this. This is one of the most important. Uh, the gallbladder has to be retracted up toward the right diaphragm, just the opposite of of doing this in an open fashion. Uh, it's from one of my fellows from a few years ago. Uh, and then you can see the same nice pictures that you, know, you saw in the open fashion. This is one of the problems that I was trying to tell you about in the video. Uh, this is the direction that that midclavicular port should uh, aim at. If you're having trouble negotiating the scope in the common duct, you need to just back up for a second and see what direction this is being held. It needs to be held along where that yellow line is. It makes things a lot easier. Uh, and again, the gallbladder is placed toward the, uh, uh, toward the uh, uh, diaphragm. Again, when you have this, you, you really need to think about doing a choledocotomy and uh, close it either primarily or with a T-tube. Uh, at least in my hands, the success rate is 90, over 90%, 97%. Uh, most of the time uh, we'll use the scope, but 40% of the time 
you can do this without a, col a coledocoscope. Bill Traverso showed that in his early work in the 1990s. So just because you don't have a coledocoscope uh, or any familiarity with it doesn't mean you, you can't at least try one of these other techniques here to get the common duct cleared. In my practice, because of the types of patients I've had and the kind of stones and, and their size, I was able to do transcystic in about 85% transductal in uh, about 20%. When I do a coleidocotomy, we've used a T-tube in about two-thirds and a primary closure uh, in about one-third. And if you've got uh, a nice clean duct, only one stone, no inflammation, doing a primary closure is, is reasonable. And always leave a drain, obviously. Okay, thank you very much. Questions for Joe. Given the uh, cost of the flexible ureteroscope or colidocoscopes, whatever we're using, uh, we found it pretty useful to use a rubber shod instrument when actually handling that scope. The metal instruments, you know, metal graspers can uh, tear that sheath, and yeah, that's, that's you a will point. definitely hear about it from the instrument people. Yeah, the, the uh, OR doesn't like to replace or have uh, a $12,000 scope uh, refurbished. Uh, Rana Khan from um, Illinois. Um, I have a question. You, for CBD expiration, can you uh, close that uh, ductal defect and leave a stent in the CBD instead of a T2? Yes, I, I actually placed the first stent back in 1991. Uh, typical stent, uh, the Allen type stent. Uh, I always like to make sure it's in the duodenum, uh, so if I do place a stent, I like to shoot a cholangiogram to make sure that the stent is all the way into the duodenum so you, you haven't compounded the problem. But it's, you can put it right through the same thing, and a lot of the same techniques that you use to put a catheter in for a cholangiogram, you can use to do that. The only disadvantage of having a stent in, two disadvantages, one, you don't have access to the duct. Uh, and number two, the patient needs uh, a, an EGD to get it out. Over here. Good afternoon, Nigel Bascom from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Dr. Peter Lynn, thank you very much for that presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, one question, when you're doing uh, or attempting the extraction using the Soliti balloon, are you concerned about stones going up into the common hepatic duct? And if so, what do you do to prevent that? that that's always a question. Um, the, I, I've fortunately uh, only seen that once or twice. And by m number one, you can recognize that, hey, the stone you were trying to drag out didn't come out where you thought it was. I immediately have the anesthetist place the patient in uh, reverse or in Trendelenburg and flush the duct in the, the two times I've seen it out of 600 cases, uh, it's come back down to the appropriate place. But that's the one potential uh, disadvantage. Over here on the left. Um, George Petra from Australia. Just uh, back to the T-tubes discussion. Um, our experience has been with T-tubes that they do cause the majority of morbidity, whether you do open or lap collar dichotomy. Um, I'm fortunate to be in a regional setting where we see a very wide spectrum of gallstone disease. Um, and what we do see because of uh, issues with latex allergies, that the old fashioned T-tubes just aren't made anymore. So the T-tubes -tubes that we get are silastic and take a lot longer than one month to you know, result in a proper biliary cutaneous fistula, which is what you want. So we've moved to like, the gentleman before me had spoken about is using the ERCP endoscopic stents, closing the bile duct over them primarily, whether we do them open and lap. And the big advantage that I see is that bottom line, the videos you've shown, those are primary bile duct stones and they will need an internal drainage procedure anyway. So whether or not they have a sphincterotomy later on, I don't think is a major issue. And it helps the RCP as to having a stent in place. Well, that's placing a stent is certainly a reasonable option, and it kind of depends on what you have available. The most important point that I think you made is that the silastic stents are different than the latex stents. They don't create that, uh, that, sh that tunnel to the abdominal wall, and they, they have to stay in a lot longer than the latex uh, T-tubes. 
which is what both of us have obviously shown you here on, uh, on our fil uh, films. Okay, Dave, one more question, then we'll go to the next talk. Uh, I'm Dr. Kamar Baloch from Pakistan. My question is, if there is the cholangiogram and cholidoscope, they serve the same purpose, is it essential to have cholangiogram and followed by the cholidoscopy? And number two, in favorable circumstances, as you told, you close the duct primarily. So what are the results of doing this? Uh, second question I understood. I'm not sure about the first one. Uh, the, we've only used the uh, primary closure in one third of those that were, where we've done a cholidocotomy. Uh, and I, I think you do, and we've not had any complications from it, but I always leave a drain just in case there is a distal obstruction. So if the patient's had pancreatitis or has a lot of cholangitis changes in the duct, uh, I won't do a primary closure. I'll put a T-tube in or, as has been mentioned, a stent. I didn't get the first question. So a technique that I've used transistically, and I want to ask if you find it valuable, is to take an endoscopic balloon that's made for dilating. Dilate the papilla up to eight millimeters slowly. You gotta get used to it, you gotta grow some, pal. Anyhow, <laughs> you dilate the papilla a little bit. We do this with the RCP, and you flush the stones out. It's called, uh, it's called, uh, pilot, it's called ampullary plasty, really. It's yeah, the sphincteroplasty. Uh, our, our friend, uh, Eddie Phillips, presented at Sages uh, probably 15 years ago uh, uh, a, a, a case where he had used the Grunzig high-pressure balloon yeah. and the patient had uh, pancreatitis post-op. They can That's, do that. Yeah. We do this endoscopically, and I have done this antegrade at the time of lap coli, and we can get pancreatitis. But I think if you do it, you have to do it slowly, and you, you don't need to do it any greater than the diameter of the biggest stone. I agree. So it's something else I think we can do transistically. Thank you.